you too. Let the call the member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It must be tough for those on the other side to have this bill come before the House as pretty much a carbon coffee copy of many of the policies that we have put forward. Sadly, not all of our policy, uh, but a number of things that we see need to happen to stop the rotting of the vet fee help scheme. Sadly, the fact that they've had to come to it kicking and screaming means that billions of dollars has been rorted from the system by dodgy providers, private providers. That's billions of dollars that should have been invested in TAFE and apprenticeships and money we just won't see again. And young people will have missed out, simply missed out on the chance of a good start. What's it like inside these operations? Well, I have seen inside some of the operations of these big providers, big marketing machines, actively and aggressively recruiting potential students. And that's not just the bad ones. The good ones do that too. The difference seems to be the level of student support, the integrity of the course material, and whether there's a genuine commitment to just getting bums on seats or to graduating students. I think graduation rates are a key indicator of whether a provider is serious or not. In 2014, the graduation rate for the 10 largest private providers was less than 5 per cent. That means 95 per cent of students who were signed up for a course didn't graduate. One of the things that concerns me is that the good providers, the good private providers, are now tarnished by the behaviour of those bad private providers. In my own electorate of Macquarie, there are very reputable long-term private providers. I've been speaking with one provider for more than two years about her concerns in the way other operators were working. She knew that fly-by-night organisations, new on the scene and with no track record of course delivery, were taking advantage of the government's failure to crack down on the sector by offering high-fee, high-loan courses that gave little or no face-to-face -face student time, so were operating at a huge profit margin. No doubt the good providers will be very pleased to finally see some action on this, but at the same time they will themselves have suffered enormously. So let's look at the measures in this bill. Capping student loans to stop rip-offs. That would be our policy. No one student should be asked to take out a loan for something they're not receiving. It should be fair value. Official data reveals the average tuition fee for Diploma of Information Technology from some private education course providers has soared, uh, and it went from $2,779 in 2011 to more than $18,000 in 2014. Some private education providers are still charging students an average of $15,500 for a Diploma of Business Management that cost $4,623 in 2011. So they've clearly seen an opportunity, and that opportunity remained for so many years that they grabbed it. Cracking down on brokers, that's something else in this bill. That would be our policy too. Uh, we all know the stories of brokers who have unscrupulously signed up elderly people, people with disabilities, people who don't speak English. Those sorts of brokers should have been out of business a long time ago. Linking publicly funded course to industry need and skills shortages is in this bill. That would be our policy. There's no doubt we should be prioritising public funding to areas where skills are most needed. Business courses, including diplomas in hair salon management and training for fitness business professionals, now account for 50 per cent of the $1.7 billion that students have borrowed for vocational training courses in 2014. There should have been action sooner. Requiring providers to reapply under new standards so only high-quality providers could access the loan system, well, that would also be our policy position. And it is important that that is in this bill. Our concern, though, is that there's no information yet about how the accreditation process will work in time for 1 January next year. And that goes to the heart of this bill, that it is coming so late and there is so little time to see what, it will, what the implementation will actually look like. And how quickly will departmental staff be expected to develop, to develop and implement the new standards, yet again more pressure placed on hard-working public servants being asked to do something in an unreasonable amount of time? 
Linking funding to student progress and completion, well, that's something I think needed to be in the policy long before now. The government's failure to act has led to a charge whatever they can get away with scheme for some dodgy providers. All the dodgy training company has to do is get students to sign up and then keep them hanging around until the first census date, and the bulk of the money goes straight through to the provider. After that, they don't really care if the students have learnt anything. We also support a vet vet loans ombudsman. Again, our policy and long overdue. There is one area of concern that I hope, though, will be looked into by the other chamber. Private drama, film and performing arts schools around the country are reeling from what I hope are unintended consequences from this legislation. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, of which I am a member, says the next wave of Australian acting talent is being put at risk by the government's decision to axe hundreds of courses. Around the country, only 12 courses in the screen, music, media and design areas look like retaining eligibility unless changes are made. These are highly credible courses that provide professional training for stage, television and film performers and film makers. These students depend on access to fee help to ensure that they can get in. And what that means is we have a diverse pool of talent applying for these very elite courses, but elite based on your talent, not based on your bank balance. We don't just want to see rich kids from the North Shore and the Eastern Suburbs filling these courses. Like everyone, the MEAA supports the need for fee gouging operators and substandard courses to be brought to account. But let's not lose incredibly talented students because they happen not to be wealthy. <coughs> the Actors Centre in Leichhardt is one of those who are shocked at the legislation uh, and at the uh, announcement of the, fee of the courses that will be eligible or not eligible. Uh, they are concerned that acting courses have been lumped in with dodgy business courses and that this really puts at risk the viability, the actual viability of the acting schools. Uh, the director of the Actors Centre, Dean Carey, who I commend uh, for speaking out on this on behalf of the whole sector, uh, says that the whole performing arts sector is potentially impacted, and with it, of course, go the hopes and dreams and sweat and tears of a whole generation of future performers whose job it will be to keep our Australian cultural independence alive. I note that this legislation allows for exemptions, and I think the performing arts sector's voice needs to be heard. Uh, when you have a school with a patron the calibre of Hugh Jackman, uh, it is great to see they are willing to speak out about this and talk to us. Let's hope that the other side listens. I should also disclose my own daughter completed the three-year diploma course thanks to vet fee help at the Actors' Centre. Another school that's been in contact with me is the Sydney Film School. Similar concerns exist for them. They've been operating for more than a decade, and this film school will have its fees capped. Now, I know a lot of people make movies on their iPhones, but in fact, learning to be a filmmaker, to work in the professional environment of international film and television, involves using expensive equipment, involves a lot of hands-on work. It's not a cheap course to run. These are professional courses run by professional people, industry, st industry standards taught by industry professionals. So capping fees at $10,000 per year, much like with pilots, will make it a prohibitively expensive course for the average budding filmmaker. But let's remember, these are not just your average filmmaker. These are hotly contested courses. You don't just apply and get accepted. They certainly don't offer you a free iPad to sign up. These courses turn people away because the standards have to be high. The Director of Education of the Sydney Film School, Catherine Millis, is an award-winning filmmaker. And she tells me that the most impacted students will be Indigenous students and low socioeconomic students. The Blue Mountains Aboriginal Film Festival was held for the first time this year, and in fact it featured a film by one of the new graduates of the Sydney Film School. These are 
young people exploring a medium to express not just their culture but to talk about who we are as Australians. Uh, and they deserve a chance and we as a nation deserve to have this sort of work being done. Let's be clear about the economic benefits too of this sector. This is an industry that generates jobs and revenue. The Victorian government has found that creative industries in that state make up 8 per cent of the economy, contributing almost 23 billion and 220,000 jobs. And the industry in New South Wales is bigger. Some estimates have it at almost twice the size. We know that nearly 5 per cent of the population works in creative industries. In my own electorate in the Blue Mountains, the Economic Enterprise Group has found that 7.6 per cent of the total population is employed in creative industries. The Blue Mountains Economic Enterprise also estimates that it is the third largest contributor to the Blue Mountains gross regional product. The total output of Blue Mountains creative industries is estimated to be $592 million. And that's just half my electorate. I'm sure we would see equal data coming from the other half of my electorate, the Hawkesbury side. So future workers in this industry, the creatives who move the industry and influence our culture, need to be nurtured, just like any other profession. Now, all this is fixable. It isn't too late. It's not completely locked in by this legislation, but we do need the Senate to inquire to make sure there's consultation. The minister can amend the course list so creative industries are not crushed alongside dodgy courses by dodgy providers. The minister can negotiate a national partnership that ensures adequate funding for creative arts. The big problem with this, this legislation, and in fact with this government, is procrastination. It's all happening late at the 11th hour after much delay. Right now, kids who are seriously thinking about what they, they will do next year, currently sitting in the HSC, currently making decisions, uh, are being left in limbo. The government seems determined to undermine the confidence right now of an entire sector. Uh, it does remind me of the 11th hour decisions that impacted so heavily on the community sector on a Christmas Eve not so long ago. Another example of this government failing to talk to people before making announcements. I urge the arts training industries to raise their concerns directly with the minister, but more importantly, for the minister to really listen and make sure the creative future of Australia doesn't disappear. What consultation has taken place with the arts industry? Well, none that we can ascertain. Does the government understand the need to evaluate the fees a course charges in relation to the people it employs to deliver those courses? If they did talk to the performing arts sector, they'd realise these courses account for actually a tiny proportion of the spend on training. They're usually courses that might have 300 people audition, but maybe two dozen are accepted annually. They go through intense face-to-face -face training. You can't learn these things online. And most of the people running these schools are doing it for the love of the industry and for the love of nurturing the next generation, running at a very low profit margin. My concern is that without consultation, uh, we, we will be in trouble. This government has redefined the meaning of the word consultation. For them, it means let's make a decision, finally, eventually, and then let's tell people about it, about it. That's what they think consultation is. All the arts sector is asking for is to have a conversation. What we need to make sure is that in our bid to stop the rorting of the private fees and the vet training, that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. My concern is that without decent consultation, this government will oversee a new dynamic where we don't produce the best actors and performers from a cross-section of our society, but we produce the best actors and performers from wealthy families, only those who can afford to pay. Having had the privilege of watching a diverse group of first-year students evolve into an equally diverse and impressive group of final-year graduates, I can only implore the government to consult with this sector. And let's keep in mind that, sure, not all these students will end up as the next Kate Blanchett, but the vast majority of the particular cohort that I have had the privilege to see are working in the industry or in closely related industries where their skills have been transferable and they are contributing economically to this society. 
and that's to all our benefit. Let's hope that this legislation stops people from being signed up for courses that they should never be signed up for, that they will never complete, that are only being signed up so someone makes money of them. Let's make sure that we don't lose the essence of what VET student loans are about, and that is helping people access the education they need to make Australia a better place.